to you is a piece of work that I did uh, over, the, over approximately 12 months in 2017. And it's uh, come out in the form of a document. this is the document it's about 148 pages long and uh, you know um, it's a fairly substantive piece of work and i'm going to try and uh, capture it in a few slides um, if you find that the theme is interesting um, i have about 50 copies of this document i'm happy to give it away for free on a promise that you will actually read it, read the document okay <laughs> So, um, with that preamble, let me begin. So, the, the title is A New Paradigm in Hindu Studies. So, before we can go to a new paradigm, we should understand what is a paradigm. And I spent a tremendous amount of time uh, understanding what, what is a a scientific research paradigm as it is understood today in the domain of philosophy of science. Um, and I'm going to capture about 40 pages of written material in one slide, okay? So a scientific paradigm consists of three things. An ontology, just the set of theories and propositions, observations and facts, established conclusions and models, which gives rise to a certain language structure to talk about a certain domain. So that's an ontology. The second is a methodology. That is how you do research in a particular area. Methods of observation, experimentation, associated tools, and instruments by which you gather data to support a, a theory. And the third is an axiology, which is a very interesting idea. It is the source of the cognitive values, the, the values, the aims and goals that are considered primary in a particular field of research. Okay? So in other words, why are you studying what you are studying, why are you researching, what is the purpose of that research, that's very critical. So, it's very abstract, I understand, but the thing about a paradigm is that it, be, it constitutes what it can be considered as received knowledge. Received knowledge, that is, the conclusions, the hypothesis, the speculations, the theories of a preceding era of scientists and researchers becomes convention and becomes received knowledge in a new generation of scholars. And it, 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 the, the so-called conclusions of the previous generation of scientists and scholars is assumed to be uncontested and even in many cases uncontestable. So it becomes received knowledge. Paradigms are enduring and they shape future research. They shape future research. In other words, whole communities of scientists, researchers participating in research traditions will build on top of the conclusions and findings of previous generations of researchers, okay? So in this way, paradigms are very enduring, enduring across the generations. And they, are, they resist being contested. Paradigms resist being contested because there is such a vast body of researchers and scholars working from within a particular paradigm, it's hard to contest them because the, there is a, a kind of a consensus, so to speak, that's built into a, a community of scholars in a particular area. Okay, so I, I thought I'll start with this. What is a paradigm? 
now we also know that paradigms can shift and uh, you know the 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 term paradigm shift uh, became a colloquial use a uh, phrase since the 60s after it was introduced by a very famous uh, philosopher of science by the name thomas kuhn and uh, perhaps the most famous example of a paradigm shift is the is the shift in our understanding from the geocentric model of the universe or the sp- the solar system to the heliocentric model of the solar system okay so i'll just illustrate in the first figure at the top the earth is in the center of the solar system and the sun is is in yellow over there four four planets away so the sun is orbiting around the earth this was the received knowledge at the, at that time the heliocentric model is the puts the sun in the middle of the solar system and the earth as orbiting around the sun and the people who first started proposing this so you might remember the names copernicus kepler and galileo they were not very well you know pleasantly received so the pope at the time was uh, pope urban i, I believe the fourth he ordered in an, uh, that galileo galilei be placed under house arrest and not allowed to write his books because he was engaging in heretic views that were opposed to the received biblical knowledge okay and it took 100 years of contesting that received knowledge before the heliocentric theory became accepted and the old theory sort of slowly died you may not believe it even today there are people who believe that the earth is in the center of the universe okay you just have to do a search on the internet and you will find many many groups propagating this that the whole thing was a fraud and of course we live in the era of fake news uh, today and uh, there's such a strong contest between what is real and what is fake going on in the in the public uh, domain so it was not without extensive and protracted opposition a real contest of ideas that a new paradigm displaces its predecessor and how does it displace it displaces by more and more scientists and researchers over time slowly coming around to the view that the new paradigm works better than the old one even in the domain of science and you can see this particular battle going on with uh, a number of different uh, uh, areas the the transition from newtonian mechanics to quantum mechanics uh, uh, etc quantum physics and in many other fields similar uh, paradigm changes paradigm shifts have occurred and will continue to occur in the future so that's a sort of a background on paradigms and paradigm shifts so now let's go to hindu studies so it's a fact that thousands and thousands of scholars of academics of administrators of uh, indologists of philologists of merchants and travelers have written about india and indian culture indian civilization hindu texts and traditions in the last 250 years thousands we may not read most of them and i thought to to represent all of them i would pick one archetypal uh, quotation from a gentleman by the name james mill who wrote a book called the history of british india and uh, if you if you just follow me with the quotation he lived uh, between 1773 and 1836 never visited india 
never visited you know max miller also never visited india so there was a whole lot of people who never visited india nevertheless wrote extensively about india commentary co- commented about india and here is a quotation in truth the hindu like the eunuch excels in the qualities of a slave dissembling treacherous mendacious to an excess which surpasses even the usual measure of uncultivated society in the highest degree conceited of themselves and full of affected contempt for others in physical sense disgustingly unclean in their persons and houses now why did i put that up it's a representative uh, quotation and this style of writing actually passed for objective knowledge about india and indians and hindus in particular at a certain time okay so this is the the tradition of scholarship where you could make declarations like this academically sounding in academically situated in universities and so on that became the received knowledge about hindus okay the difficulty we face today we as in our generation we face today is that these theories and methods developed by western scholars has become the only available default paradigm the standard there is no competing paradigm or alternate paradigm available to study societies and cultures indians and hindus are yet to develop one and i put the quote uh, 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 the name of dr balu and this is dr s n balagangadhar rao of ghent university in belgium okay so i spent a, a, a lot of time with dr balu in uh, last year in 2017 and much of what i'm going to speak about is based on his work so this is a picture of dr balu okay so he's a very unique person and uh, i tried very hard to invite him to waves uh, so that he could speak uh, in my place really speaking but he was not well and he couldn't make it and i'm uh, sort of summarizing his ideas so virtually in every field of the human sciences the humanities encompassing such diverse disciplines such as philosophy theology sociology history psychology anthropology religious studies economics and many others there is a prevailing understanding of how to study india what questions to ask about it okay what questions to ask about it which includes what questions not to ask about it right what answers to give to those questions what to say and what not to say and so on this received knowledge reproduces descriptions of india that transform it into an inferior and backward culture in comparison to western culture both through presupposition and conclusion okay the circularity of these arguments is one of the very key things that dr balu has been working on start with the assumption and then prove the prove your assumption at the end of the argument so so this is a picture taken from a california school textbook uh, you might have many of you might have seen it i just put it in there just so that we recognize the downstream consequences the it's sort of like when you if you pollute the ganga upstream downstream you get garbage right so this is a garbage hinduism is garbage is a is a picture from a sixth grade textbook which still exists after 12 years of battling with the board of education this picture is still exists in school textbooks we have not been able to decisively eliminate it even today so it's about the caste system the social system brahmin kshatriya vaishya and then, and then the question that the question that is asked of the sixth grade student is why did the aryans create the caste system it's a very interesting question the, even the framing of the question is why did the aryans created the caste system asked of a sixth grade student 
and the student now has to answer that question okay this is a downstream effect so you get you get the template of the arguments okay this is the trope the templates the aryan invasion brahmanism the rise of brahmanism the caste system untouchability dalit suppression human rights discrimination and the logical conclusion of these arguments is hinduism and the hindu people as a whole are just one massive human rights nightmare so all that we have done is produce human rights problems and the west now has to pro- give us solutions to these problems this is the template and it gets reinforced again and again with every paper that works from within the received knowledge the default paradigm so i just i'm just illustrating this because we got to understand it as a paradigm a way of doing research so the this default research paradigm and the precedent established by many thousands of scholars determines what it means to study indian culture and traditions it defines and constrains what questions to ask about our culture what issues we should investigate about hinduism how we should go about researching these questions long chains of citations have established many so called uncontestable facts about india and hinduism so the topics such as the aryan invasion the emergence of brahmanism the amorphous nature of hinduism the oppressive evils of the caste system the problem of poverty under development untouchability the question of human rights are implicitly assumed to be the central questions facing academicians both in india and the west okay so what do we do about it what is the response how do hindus well meaning hindus who want to study their own culture and how do we respond to this see this paradigm carries an enormous amount of freight i like this word freight it's a it's a weighty paradigm so we can go into agreement with the western these views okay which is what many indian scholars do they end up agreeing with this and so they benefit from participating in the ecosystem that sustains this particular template of studying hinduism and in india the second group is the ones who appease this group they they say they try to say different things academically new uh, present new ideas but you got to play within the rules of the existing framework so you you know you sort of participate in both sides butter the bread on both sides as they say it's an interesting term <coughs> and then there is a third group who oppose the western views and accuse them of being racist eurocentric biased etc etc okay so there are three responses three uh, places from where one can respond to this paradigm these are the three now this is a, this is a picture of the so you can think of it in terms of two two ways the insiders shraddha and the outsiders suspicion if you think of it in these two templates the you know the methodology and approach and earlier i spoke about the ontology the methodology and the axiology the three which constitutes a paradigm it gives rise to the way one approaches hindu society hindu culture hindu civilization etc and and you get what you get in terms of the temp- the, the key anchor points of discourse within that paradigm now if you situate yourself in a different place they address the same texts the hindu texts traditions and practices with a different methodology a different axiology different ontology you get a whole different domain of understanding okay now this is a completely different language domain it's a different ontology yeah <laughs> who's saying that ah pankaj thank you so this is a different ontology 
and that's a different ontology right and we keep we keep getting drawn into the western ontology that has been created which as i said which carries the freight of the last 250 years behind it so the question is how do you shift it how do you create a paradigm shift that's the question <laughs> so you have these two paradigms right the indic and the western broadly speaking even though many indians have now moved over to the western paradigm and many western five minutes ouch okay so many westerners have come into this paradigm we see two things happening okay other than these two communities sort of operating in their own ecosystems their own environments not talking to each other when they do talk this is what happens we accuse them of being eurocentric racist orientalist and colonialist right and they accuse us of being biased and uncritical brahmanical and driven by hindutva concerns okay so you can see this you know it's like fox news and msnbc talking to each other right <laughs> so this is our current reality okay so how do you step out of this is the question now i i seem to have set the stage for the the actual conversation but i'm i'm running out of time already so i'll skip okay i'll skip this slide so in creating a new paradigm in or in exploring a new paradigm what comes to our rescue is the old adi shankara's adhyasa bhashya snake and the rope most of you know this so to the man who sees a coiled up snake in his home where there is really only a rope it doesn't really matter that it is not a real snake but only appears to him to be so his panic stricken reaction is as real for him as though it were a real rope a real snake sorry a real snake right this is straight out of adhyasa bhashya adi shankara you know the famous now orientalism the style of writing is a description of the european or western experience of india that is it provides a description of how one form of life one culture the european culture looks at another form of life the asian culture broadly and the indian in particular if we accept that orientalism is europe's way of coming to terms with the reality that asia is okay you can replace it with india then orientalism refers to this experience and the way europe has reflected about this experience however orientalist discourse presents itself as a true description of asian cultures and societies as the truth orientalism then becomes the european way of thinking about its experience of asian cultures what is typical about this european way of thinking is that its reflections on its experience take the form of an apparent description of asian cultures and societies okay so this is the sort of the separation of the snake and the rope okay so this is the first principle so even though european or western understanding of india manifesting itself in the form of a very vast corpus of writings about india across diverse fields of the social sciences and humanities is presented as objective knowledge about india and its culture it is also an example of adhyasa i mean this is the clue to the beginnings of creating a new paradigm in hindu studies the british descriptions had more to do with their experiences of an alien culture than with the truth about india and her people yet they spoke as though their experience of india was synonymous with the facts about india when we look over, took over the reins of our country from them we did not just inherit colonial buildings and colonial bureaucracy we also actively took over the descriptions as though the experiences of the british are also uncontestable facts about india okay in other words we inherited 
an ontology a methodology and an axiology about how to think about ourselves the the paradigm has a second premise which is very important why does this man see a snake where there is only a rope the man clearly was projecting the snake onto the rope isn't it the snake existed only in his own imagination he does so because he had a predilection to do so a tendency to do so born of a prior traumatic experience with the snake perhaps now he sees snakes everywhere you see the analogous question there is now available for investigation is the following what is it about western culture that predisposes it to see snakes where there are only ropes and insist that this snake knowledge constitutes the objective truth about the rope world you understand this is second question it's a question is a research question it's not a i mean it's not a, there's no easy answer to this but it's a question that opens up a whole world so there's a quotation from balu one more minute okay the implications of these two premises right is that in numerous ways the west has been projecting its own history and culture upon other cultures that it studied and and on and on okay they they saw buddhism and its relation to hinduism as being analogous to the relationship between protestant christianity and its relationship to catholicism okay and and you can now begin to generate a tremendous amount of examples of how this projection has been going on the adhyasa the projecting of the snake on the rope how it has happened can be investigated so in short right we st- the structure of the new paradigm is you start with descriptions of hindu culture instead of taking the those descriptions there is western descriptions as the truth about indian culture you ask a question why did they describe it that way right and you can come up with two answers you go to the top if we end up in a place of accusation you know we we can accuse them of being biased eurocentric racist colonialist etc which doesn't help the discourse right ultimately but going back to our traditions if we get into reformulating it the answer why is due to error and misunderstanding due to adhyasa projection of their own experience then you end up with two possibilities explain the source of these descriptions by examining the west's own past history and culture and provide alternative indian descriptions of hindu culture free from the constraints of western writings this is the paradigm okay this is just in in one slide this is a paradigm and a tremendous amount of work there is 40 years of work that has gone on in this paradigm that summarized very briefly in this document and i think i think it holds enormous promise for the future i'll finish with one one quotation i am i know just one final quotation a new scientific truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the light ultimately because its opponents eventually die and a new generation grows up that is familiar with the new paradigm it's a very interesting quotation by max planck okay so th- these are all clues to the way forward thank you very much